This is a bit of an artsy-fartsy thing. I want to put a theory on the table. It's about journalism and the arts. And it's about public broadcasting, and it's about Canada. That both arts and journalism, and just to get to your reaction to this, whether there's any mileage in this, both arts and journalism, we recount stories. In the arts, we recount stories that create imaginative universes, imaginative expectations. In journalism, you recount stories of what happens in the world, what happens in politics, what happens in culture, society, and all the rest of it. With a vibrant arts imaginative world created by vibrant arts, you assist the audiences to make strong, independent, imaginative choices about how they live their lives and how they live in their culture and their community, whatever. But from the imaginative side, you build an imaginative universe in which, if it's vibrant, there's a strong independence by people who play in that universe as spectators. Journalism creates, also creates a universe of choices. And a strong, independent journalism creates strong, independent choices in citizens or the electorate. And without journalism fun functioning, fulfilling that role, you weaken the independence of choices of people when they buy a product or when they go to the ballot box. And independent and paralleling is the imaginative universes created by artists, which also help the strength of independence of imagination, of expectations. And that those are almost two pillars or two pistons, as it were, that actually support democracy. I, I agree with all that. Okay, so I'm not off the wall. No, I, I, I agree. And, you know, I, I had, I had uh, an experience uh, on the UK tour that we just did, which, which I found fascinating. We just talked a little about it before we started. Uh, when, when we set out to do this tour, uh, we wanted to do a, a we wanted to do uh, uh, an NAC orchestra tour of the UK that wasn't about the Canadian relationship with Britain in a hundred years ago. It was about Canada's relationship with itself a hundred years ago. That, that in effect, uh, we wanted to tell the story. We wanted people to become aware of the story that in, the, uh, in October of 1914, 31,000 Canadian kids, young men, uh, who most of whom had never left Canada, arrived on the shore of, of, of Great Britain, were, were, were trained or bused to Salisbury and, and pitched tents uh, on Salisbury Plain and began to train for the next three or four months uh, to go to France. Worst winter in 50 years in, uh, in the UK. It was a horrible experience for those Canadian soldiers. Again, they were 20, 21, 22 years old. Nobody in Canada knows any of that. And so what we wanted to do was to do an orchestra tour that a hundred years later, to the day, a group, of, a group of 70 musicians with musical instruments celebrate what those 31,000 kids did a hundred years before and to tell that story. And, and they honor them with musical instruments. And that is a great way that the arts can tell the history of a people uh, without having to read through 300 pages of a book. It's just, it, whenever we told that story, people, you know, people got the hair on the back of their neck started to stand up and they said, I get it now, I get it. So those kids were there and, and uh, holy God. So it wasn't about Britain, it was about us. It was about our own history, about our own story and the way that the arts can tell that story. And, uh, and it's one of the reasons that that one of the people we met in Salisbury said it was the first orchestra tour he had ever seen where the narrative drove the tour and, uh, and the concerts fit within the narrative. So that's the storytelling you're talking about. And most of the money for that tour you had to raise privately? All of it, 100%. We raised $820,000 for that tour and uh, we did it all privately.